Good, every, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've got an interesting guy to introduce you to tonight. Darian Gordon is his name, and he is a activist and aspiring politician from St. Thomas, Ontario. He uh, has uh, written some articles. He's very active in uh, politics and, uh, and, and, and uh, political issues, and he's been described to me as one of the brightest young men you'd ever want to meet. Darian, are you one of the brightest young men? You'd want to ever you know, meet? I, I don't think I'd go that far. I, I've met incredible people all around. I certainly wouldn't uh, say I'm any, any more special than any of those other people. But, you know, honored to be on your show today. So tell us a little bit about you. St. Thomas. Where's St. Thomas? So it's right by London, Ontario. A uh, small little town, about 40,000 people. Uh, one of my favorite towns I've, I've ever lived, though, I, I have to say. I used to be from Niagara Falls, so uh, definitely a change in uh, amount of people here. But and How uh, old are you, and what grade are you in? I'm 16, and I'm currently going into grade 11. And what's, uh, what's in your future? Are you going to uh, go to university? Yep, looking forward to university, hopefully uh, University of Toronto or University of uh, Ottawa. I'm hoping to study uh, political science and psychology. Okay, and so you're an aspiring politician. Tell me about that. Why? Uh, so I've been involved in politics since I was 10 years old, and it's it's been a it's been a fun ride. You know, uh, lots of interesting stuff. I love talking to people. I love uh, making change in the community and uh, helping people, uh, improving people's lives in total. So uh, how do you get involved I, in I definitely... politics when you're 10 years old? Oh, it was certainly interesting. So it started off in. Uh, my uh, grade five uh, social studies class, and we were learning about the election as it was 2015, uh, the federal election, and uh, we all were split up into parties. We did this political test, and I was put into the uh, Liberal Party, and I was the leader, so we had to win the election. We eventually won, and that, that sold me. And so what have you done since then? You say you've been active. What have you been doing? Have you been Candace, canvassing? Have you been writing? Have you been doing, what have you been doing? All of that kind of stuff. So mostly uh, writing, canvassing, helping on campaigns, running uh, social media, graphic design kind of stuff, uh, just to help any cause I can in terms of politics and uh, especially uh, elections coming up, which I was hoping there'd be one today. Apparently not, but hopefully soon. And, and you were appointed uh, onto the Liberal Party in your, uh, in your class. Is that where you've stayed or have you gone somewhere else? Kind of a mix of both, honestly. Um, I've been a Liberal up until 2019, like a hardcore Liberal. I kind of shifted away in 2020 a bit because I'm not a fan of how the deficit has been handled, not a fan of some of the scandals. So I joined uh, Peter McKay's campaign for conservative leadership. I helped him a bit especially on the Facebook page, which had over 3,000 members. We helped, uh, you know, curate posts, gain support for Peter. And uh, unfortunately, he did end up losing. Uh, so right now, I would currently say I am more on the liberal side. I'm just not as much a fan of Justin Trudeau himself. And so are you going to help uh, a local liberal candidate or the liberal party? Or what are you going to do in the upcoming election if it happens? Uh, certainly. So politics is all local for me. So I'm going with our our uh, liberal candidate here, which we don't know who it's going to be yet, but I'm certainly excited to find out. Yep. And and do you know who uh, the candidates are? Um, I know the conservative candidate is going to be uh, Karen Vecchio again. I know she's done a good job serving in this community. Um, she's been our uh, member of parliament for, I believe, six years now. So it's been a while. Uh and I don't know who the other candidates have been yet. I don't think they've been officially confirmed, but there have been some rumors. But are there candidates that have uh, announced their candidacy for the Liberal Party nomination? Not yet, necessarily, but I have heard some stuff about potential candidates. Um, apparently, I'm not, I'm not allowed to say who necessarily yet, but uh, they are certainly a very smart person. Okay, so 16, year, believe... 16 years old. What are your big issues? My big issues personally are uh, climate change. Um, I believe in a lot of uh, social justice uh, movements to uh, have equality for everyone. Um, the, the economy is a big one for me too, especially with the pandemic and a lot of people losing their jobs and livelihoods. I believe we have to uh, reopen and get as many people back to uh, sustainable jobs as possible. 
So climate change and social justice issues would be more liberal economy and getting people back to work would be more conservative. So are you a blue liberal or a red Tory maybe? Uh, exactly. Yes. So I would actually consider myself as both really depends on who the candidates are. Uh, if Peter McKay were to win the leadership, I would have stayed in the conservative party. Uh, unfortunately he didn't. So I'm back in the liberals, but I am economically conservative, uh, socially liberal or socially moderate, uh, and more libertarian, especially on certain uh, issues. Libertarian? How does a libertarian justify being in the liberal party that some people would call like, uh, you know, the nanny uh, party, uh, trying to tell us what to do all the time? Now, that is certainly a tough question there, but I'm, I'm, I'm against Bill C-10. I'm against... Uh, uh, Bill C-36. So that, that's kind of where I fall on those issues. I, I disagree with censorship as a whole. Um, I believe everyone should have the freedom to do whatever they like as long as it doesn't harm anyone or believe whatever they want to believe as long as it doesn't cause any direct harm to anyone. And, uh, you know, overall freedom of speech, freedom of uh, expression. We're chatting tonight with Darian Gordon, uh, who was described to me as uh, an extremely bright uh, young uh, gentleman that was going to be uh, someone of note in the future. He's an aspiring politician. He's an activist. He's in grade 16. Sorry, he's, in, in, he's 16 in grade 11 in St. Thomas, Ontario. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Darian in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour in Second and Sixty. We're chatting tonight with Darian Gordon. He's a uh, young man from uh, St. Thomas, Ontario. He's uh, been politically active since he was 10 years old. Uh, he is 16 in grade 11 right now, and he wants to go to the University of Toronto or the University of Ottawa, study political uh, science, or I think you said philosophy? Uh, psychology, yeah. Psychology. Oh, I apologize, because you want to understand how people work and think. Um, and, uh, and he wants to be a politician. So do you think you're going to run for politics? Hopefully, I'm, I'm honestly uh, hoping to start early, uh, potentially running for city council when I turn 18 falls on exact, exact perfect timing, you know, uh, that would be a very fun experience, uh, learning curve, for sure, but uh, something interesting to look forward to. And I'm, I'm personally just looking forward to vote. First of all, yep. I can't wait until I can finally vote. Okay, so let's start with that issue. Um, some people have suggested that the voting age should uh, be reduced to 16. What do you think of that? I would somewhat agree and disagree at the same time, simply because I do think young people do have a general grasp of politics, especially considering civics class is um, in grade 10, where that's usually taken in high school. And a lot of people learn about it in grade five as well uh, for social science. Uh, but uh, overall, I would say it tends to be a bit uh, biased towards the further left, such as the NDP and the Green Party. Uh, not just based on, you know, key issues, but based upon idealism and uh, what they think is possible without thinking of the economic um, repercussions behind it, such as some of the policies of the NDP and the Green Party. So I would say I do believe 16 year olds are mature. I don't know how well it would work for the Liberal Party or for the Conservative Party, uh, but it would certainly benefit the NDP and the Greens. Okay, so let's not talk about it from a political impact standpoint. Let's talk about it from a human rights standpoint. Do you think that 16-year-olds that have the right to drive, that uh, have the right to consent to have sex with whoever they want, um, should they have the right to elect uh, their political leaders? I think from that lens, uh, definitely. I personally think the uh, driving age should be lower ba or higher based on certain statistics that indicate younger people are more likely to uh, die or get severely injured from car crashes than any other age demographic. But so I, I would suggest raising that to 18. But that that, that is a completely uh, whole different issue there. But I do think 16 year olds are mature enough, at least the majority of us, to to vote, to express ourselves politically, and uh, get involved in certain issues. Uh, as we've seen with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement from last year, we've seen a lot of teenagers and a lot of young people getting involved when, when they never have been before, which is certainly a good thing. A lot of people are becoming more politically aware. Uh, so I do believe 16 year olds should have the right to vote in, in that regard. So one of the reasons why some people think that uh, the voting age should be reduced is that uh, if uh, you know you had the experience of actually voting while you were still in high school 
And uh, given that, uh, you know, when we don't have minority governments, uh, there's an election every four years, uh, that would mean that 50% uh, of all the people in, uh, in school would, would vote once before they left school if uh, the voting age was reduced to 16. Um, that once you do it the first time, you tend to do it for the rest of your life. People that uh, um, go to a blood donor clinic uh, in high school tend to go to a blood donor clinic the rest of their life. If they don't go to a blood donor clinic, if they're not introduced, they just don't tend to do it. Um, frankly, beer companies know this. If they get you to be starting to drink your brand of beer, um, when you're in college, uh, you tend to drink that brand of beer the rest of your life. Uh, baseball companies, um, hockey teams know this. If you put on a sweater or a cap for a specific team, 80% of the people will be that team's supporter for the rest of their life. So if, if one of our objectives is to increase youth participation and increase the electorate participation forever, isn't that a good idea? Oh, I certainly think so. I think we need higher turnout rates. Uh, we have countries like Australia where it's mandatory to vote or you get fined, which I think is certainly a interesting concept. Um, I'm not sure if that should happen here because I think everyone should have the right to do what they want. But I also believe, you know, voting is, is essential to uh, maintaining our democracy. And as we see in the uh, United States, we have a lot of threats against our democracy recently um, that may be unseen now but might rear its ugly head later um such as the uh, capital insurrection that was an awful moment uh for anyone who had to see that and it terrified me to see because it could just as easily happen here with as much information uh disinformation and uh lies being spread to the point where people believe it and feel they have to take action okay so two issues here number one would you support mandatory voting yes a libertarian actually potentially supporting mandatory voting? Potentially. I think a fine is a bit extreme. I think, um, or the amount that, that, that they usually fine you in Australia, I can't remember the exact amount off the top of my head, but like, I mean, $5, is, that's not that bad. But I don't think it's necessarily um, the best idea. It's good for supporting democracy. It's good for... Uh, you know, raising our uh, We need to get rate. a driver's license. We need to prove that we've got car insurance. We need to, uh, you know, uh, what else? Uh, you know, we need to, we need to do, we need to get a passport. Um, why, why don't we need to vote if you want to be a citizen? I mean, certainly a good, uh, a good point raised there. I think uh, being a good citizen, a good citizen in a democracy would be educating yourself on all the issues in any election cycle. Um, well, it was know, a libertarian, what... I can't remember his name. Pia, no, who was it that said, uh, I'd rather have uh, the Boston telephone book vote in an election than uh, the, the intelligent people because, uh, or just the intelligent people because um, over time the crowd makes the right decisions. And you know, I think that's what we need. We need more people making the right decisions. And I feel that's partially what gets the wrong governments in place. It's. Uh, misinformation and anger most of the time. Okay, so th that's the other issue you talked about, the capital insurrection. And uh, and, and that was based primarily uh, on misinformation, the big lie. Um, what do we do to solve that? You know, that is certainly uh, interesting. It is a tough, tough decision. I, and I mean, even as a libertarian, I do support Donald Trump's uh, banishment from Twitter. I feel free speech only goes so far. You can't incite and insurrection and expect to still be allowed to uh, spew these views in public, um, especially how it can inspire so many people to uh, embark in violent acts such as the one on January 6th. But um, I think we need more honest media. We need less bias. We need more fact checkers. Uh, we need more people willing to not just um, look at one thing and then move on, you have to be able to research it. And one more thing, I think they should change the algorithm on social media apps such as Facebook and Instagram, because for a while, um, if you start liking these certain posts, those posts will get recommended to you and you'll get stuck in an echo chamber. And that's what right. happened to a lot of people uh, okay. who joined QAnon and joined some of these conspiracies. It creates an echo chamber where the only there's no uh, criticism of your views. There's no um, people questioning it. It's just all a group of people who believe the one thing. So you said climate change was one of your big issues. Is climate change real? Climate change is certainly real. 
How do you know? Well, most scientists have come to a consensus that uh, climate change is real. You can feel the effects. Um, certainly right now it's 44 degrees out. Um, abnormal weather, uh, increased wildfires, increased hurricanes, natural disasters, all of these kind of uh, effects of climate change are showing, uh, especially recently. And we're seeing the need to stop it more and more frequently. This uh, young lady from uh, Scandinavia that uh, has you know, captured the world's interest as an advocate. Um, how come you're not that in Canada? Oh, you know, um, I feel we should be amplify amplifying voices of more Indigenous people and people of color who some of these issues affect more, especially Indigenous people. Um, climate change is affecting more uh, poorer communities. It's affecting um, a lot of different people, but I don't feel I'm necessarily the person to do so. I do speak at climate rallies. I do uh, advocate for things here locally in my community, such as uh, garbage cans on the trails, because there were a lot. There was a lot of litter there. I was I was declined by the mayor three times before there was a new election. I, I finally convinced the new mayor to do so, but um, I don't feel I'm the right person to uh, be the next Greta Thunberg. Okay, so you said some social progressive issues were also really important to you. What, what type of issues? So I feel we need more clean water for Indigenous people. Um, we need, um, oh, why am I blanking on this right now? I did have something in my head. Uh, do you believe? Uh, I would say do, do, at do you first. Agree with, in uh, women's right to choose. Certainly, yes. I, I, I am pro choice. And uh, what about. Uh, um, equality, uh, um, gender equality. Do you uh, think that uh, we should have pay equity? Uh, should we have uh, laws that uh, enforce uh, people get uh, paid uh, equal value for equal work? Oh, certainly. I don't, I don't believe there's any reason to prevent people from getting paid uh, less for the same work, regardless of their gender or sex or, eth or ethnicity or any, any other factor. I believe everyone should get paid the same as long as they're working the same. There's a bill in front of the Senate that has been stalled uh, that outlaws conversion therapy for people that uh, may think they're uh, um, homosexual. Um, the conversion therapy would, would be outlawed. Do you agree with that? Yes, yeah, strongly against uh, conversion therapy. I feel, first of all, it's homophobic, and second of all, it's anti-science. There's no science to back up um, that it even works. And second of all, uh, why would you want to change someone from being who they are to someone they're not? What about gun control? How do you feel about gun control? Gun control, uh, I'm not as educated on that issue, I'll be fair. Um, but I feel in Canada, we are mo our gun laws are, you know, decent. I believe in the U.S., the gun laws are a bit more uh, complicated there. That's why we see a lot of gun violence there in the United States. But I don't believe we should entirely ban guns from Canada because uh, it seems like it's only a few one-off incidents that are happening. Otherwise, our laws are strong enough to prevent this kind of stuff. I feel we need to target illegal guns more and uh, gang violence. So Aaron O'Toole, who you did not vote for in the conservative leadership, is not doing well in the polls. And uh, based on current polling, if there is an election today, it would look like the Liberals would actually do better than the last election, better than Stephen Harper. Um, and uh, did, uh, and uh, um, they did versus Stephen Harper and or they did uh, versus uh, um, the uh, prior Tory leader. Um, so Aaron O'Toole would end up being a failure. Uh, do you agree with that? I think I can see why that makes sense. Uh, judging by the polling, he's not doing well, but I can also see the frustration within the Conservative Party and outside the Conservative Party because he started off in the leadership election blasting Peter McKay for being a liberal um, and all these kind of stuff, mocking him for being socially uh, progressive. Uh, but it turns out he was the same way. So he misled a lot of voters in that way which I do prefer him being socially progressive and uh, being a bit more of a red Tory. Uh, but he misled a lot of people. And he, it seems so far uh, that he doesn't necessarily stand for anything. I can't see where many of his policies are other than opposing certain things that, that the liberals are proposing. So, I so I'm not that, exactly uh, sure what plan he has. So I presume that you think that if the conservatives had uh, 
voted uh, for Peter McKay, they'd be doing better than uh, they are with Aaron O'Toole right now. Definitely. I think Peter McKay has proved himself in government for years, and he was the, he was the leader of the PC party before it merged with uh, the uh, Canadian Alliance. So he, he has proved himself politically that he is uh, able to be a leader and a good leader at that. Now, when he took over control of the PC party, um, he promised, uh, actually in writing, um, to not merge it with uh, the Canadian Alliance. Didn't that uh, not uh, bother you? It did at first, but then I realized he did make the right decision because the PCs were almost obsolete at that point. Um, the election with Kim Campbell certainly did not go well. Uh, the election after that didn't go well for them either. So I don't think they had any other option really than to unite all the conservatives. Uh, whether it's the best choice or not uh, is yet to be seen as we're seeing how divided the conservative party is. Uh, based on social conservative, social progressive lines. Um, so I guess that is yet to be seen, but I feel he did make the right decision at the time. So in the last election, um, you know, you won, the Conservatives won in, uh, in Southwestern Ontario. Um, they, uh, they won in the prairies. Um, they did not win in the 905. And I think they lost the election because they could not appeal to suburban. And St. Thomas isn't really suburban, but uh, but you sound like you're a suburban kind of voter, given the attitudes that you've been uh, talking about. Um, what does the Conservative Party have to do to appeal to the 905, the suburban area around Toronto, do you think? Well, I think there are some substantive things, and there's also uh, optical things. I think, first of all, uh, the vote that most of the Conservative Party uh, believed that uh, climate change wasn't real certainly didn't help. That, that set them back quite a bit with young people. And also the conversion therapy bill, you see how Aaron O'Toole is not supporting it, but many of his MPs are on the complete other side of the fence. And you see many young people seeing the Conservative Party as a party of people like Derek Sloan and uh, even Leslie Lewis, who's a bit less far right than he is, but still far right enough that it scares off a lot of progressive voters. I feel if Aaron O'Toole could convince his caucus to uh, you know, play it more progressive, uh, vote on more progressive things, even though it would be uh, stripping them of a conscious vote. Uh, I think it's probably the best for optics. And but if they did that, don't you think they'd lose the social conservatives, and we'd have a new reform party, a new alliance party, or a new uh, um, you know wild rose party uh, that would uh, split off uh, for the social conservatives, and then devastate the social, the, the, the balance of the conservative party and the progressive part of the conservative party, the progressive conservative party would end up being two or three seats like it was with Kim Campbell. Well, certainly a concern there, but I think, I don't think it will happen simply because the People's Party of Canada isn't doing as well as it should be right now, especially since they are the only party that is openly anti-lockdown and you see how many people are also anti-lockdown and pro reopening everything. So, I mean, the People's Party had their chance. They've had their chance this whole pandemic with people getting frustrated with uh, the premiers and the prime minister for not acting on vaccines quick enough. And uh, all of this frustration boiling up, you, you'd think it would go to the People's Party, but it's not. It's going back to the liberals. Most people, uh, as the polls suggest, would be voting liberal if an election were called today. So it doesn't seem to be that that fraction is there or that it's enough to make a difference. Even Derek Sloan was kicked out of the conservative caucus and that went nowhere. It, no social conservatives uh, really left the party in mass numbers. I think people were frustrated and they were disappointed after that, but uh, seems to have uh, all blown over. You said you didn't like uh, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau. Why not? Well, I feel uh, it's mostly symbolism with him. And while I believe symbolism is good politically uh, to get votes, I, I want more substance, especially on the clean water issue, on uh, reducing the deficit, um, because the amount that all Canadians have to pay in taxes is overwhelming. It was on the... Uh, the uh, Canadian Taxpayers Federation website. It's overwhelming. I can't remember the number off well, the top of, course, of my head, but it's- Of course, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is gonna call it overwhelming. The amount of money going to taxes in Canada is, you know, 
not quite, but almost at a, a generational low or a couple generational low. Um, you'd have to go back, uh, you know, a couple generations to have it this low. Yes, but I, I believe it's going to spike soon, especially with all the spending. I mean, pandemic spending, I think that's justified. I think no budget needed for a pandemic. It's, it's very unprecedented. I, I think you need to just do what you have to do in terms of uh, public health emergencies such as this one. But he should have started balancing the budget beforehand uh, during prosperous times, uh, especially compared to Paul Martin and John Chrétien. They, they're my favorite liberals. Look at, look at uh, Donald Trump, a right-wing Republican. He's increased, he increased the deficit and the debt more than anyone ever has. And that's true. That's why I think uh, all these people who are conservative supporting Trump truly shouldn't. He's nowhere near a conservative. He's nothing. He's there's nothing about him that's conservative. He's run for many different political parties. He's just out there for attention. He's not not a good leader either. Darian, are you going to be prime minister? Hopefully. I want to hopefully. Vote for you. Oh, thank you. There's a 18 year old or so that's uh, an MPP in uh, St. Catharines. It's time for you, buddy. Oh, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Good night.